um, now just make a few remarks on stylized models. Um, and uh, for this, I'm transitioning to a different slide deck also posted. Uh, and I want to just situate us with respect to this. Um, you know, age based models are um, one of these mechanisms that impress because of their great flexibility, diversity of repertoire, capabilities um, in all different areas. And they have a formidable potential for leveraging big data, geographic data, as we've just talked about, capturing model generated longitudinal data, comparing it to data in the world, cross sectional data, data that, that is spatial in its nature, um, but also network um, related. Um, we can, we can calibrate it to it. We can inform it with parameters. Um, uh, and, and really, there's tremendous opportunities for that. But, but I think um, a focus, it's easy to get caught up in the mindset that that's what, you know, that agent-based models are inherently models uh, that, that exist um, in the context of massive amounts of, of data. And, and similarly, it's, it's easy to get caught up in a mindset that agent-based models are inherently more complicated than, um, more descriptively complex, um, and, and have tons more moving parts than compartmental models. Um, um, the truth is more subtle than this. And you know, it, it goes back um, and it bears emphasis, um, emphasizing the fact that when we think about dynamic models and their uses in general, there are dozens of different uses to which dynamic models can be fruitfully applied tasks to which they can be fruitfully pressed. Um, my colleagues, Josh Epstein and, and, um, uh, and, and the, the, former, um, uh, the former head of the School of Public Health at, at University of Pittsburgh, Don Burke, um, have described in the literature dozens of, of possible uses of, of dynamic models. And, you know, it's important to remember that models serve diverse foci. Um, some, some do indeed leverage the big data revolution and, 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 and seek, you know, high empirical uh, validity and comparability, um, uh, seek to look at very complex intervention designs, seek to represent an external situation of great texture and, um, and, and richness um, empirically. That is a use of agent-based models and they can scale to the occasion in ways that are quite unique in the modeling landscape. But it's not the only uses of them. And, and I think it bears noting, you know, the fact that it can be used to bring together stakeholders for common understanding. Um, for, for forming a common mental model about certain challenges and an and underlying representation of the system. We'll, we'll talk later in this course about models as boundary objects for people from diverse languages and backgrounds, diverse levels of education, and people with, a, with less than a high school degree alongside clinicians or alongside public health officers, medical health officers, um, speaking, um, speaking with you know, computer scientists or mathematicians about a common system and the ability to represent the system visually and in a, in a transparent fashion aids communication 
because they can point to certain things and have some sense of relating to the same area of the system, even if their languages, their vernaculars are different. Other models are used for you know, shifting thinking of stakeholders, aha moments that, that serve as kind of um, to, 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 to change how a person approaches uh, a certain type of problem. Um, and yet other cases, you know, our models are, are used to um, try to challenge a current way of thinking and, and show the plausibility uh, of another way of, of thinking about a certain set of processes. And you know, for most of those needs, there's not this need to represent this uh, incredibly textured external situation. We're trying to represent something that teaches a lesson that, that changes people's way of thinking about it without trying to, to, to come anywhere near a quasi-comprehensive characterization for the types of issues and the major issues in the system governing the factors we want. No, we're, we're trying to, we're not trying to depict the situation in Toronto or the situation in Saskatoon for this. We're not trying to depict you know, the texture of, of segregation in Los Angeles. We're trying to, trying to, to shape thinking. And, and agent-based models can excel at this. And there are times where agent-based models can be formulated in a way that's descriptively very simple. It admits to a few sentence description um, with really powerful out, uh, sort of um, thinking, that, that shifts in thinking that come from it. And it's not necessarily the case that it's more complex, that it's more daunting or more obscure than a compartmental model, um, for example. Uh, compartmental models have their own challenges. Um, there's, uh, as, as Mark, my, my late friend Mark Page once commented, um, you know, there's, there's two types of things going on, a description of the process and, um, I'm not sharing slides right now and um, and a yeah. an aggregation and often they they result in, in in formulas being used which may be puzzling to stakeholders really puzzling um, involving contacts and you're assuming some sort of random mixing it's this very abstract idea and there's a you know, formula C times I over S plus I plus N times beta times S, you know, associated with force of infection. And there's all these concepts being woven in there and sort of assumptions and approximations. Whereas, you know, you depict people interacting at a granular level and having contact patterns being partnered up and then switching partners and each person is infected or not and can transmit it to others. There's something that's familiar and, and perhaps um, um, concrete enough to relate to the experience of, of people who might otherwise be thrown off by a high level, more abstract description. Um, so interface models can be powerful for their simplicity. It can be powerful for the what if, for the insights that can come from the, the epiphanies, the ahas. And, and really, that's what this next lecture will be about. It will have to be on Tuesday, mostly. But we're going to be going through stylized models. And like with GIS models, some of those we've seen. But some we won't have. Um, for example, I'll be talking about a model of trust um, uh, and, and dynamics of, of trust um, uh, captured in a, in a model. The goal here is not to have a full depiction of all the factors in the world germane to you know the trust uh, situation, but rather to to get us to think through just what a, a few factors would would imply if interacting, maybe they'll they'll give rise to emergent behavior that's surprising that's um, uh, that that surprises us for what it can explain. So 
we're going to be talking about this theory explication or articulation spectrum um, where we have models that seek to take existing theory and explicate it, um, sort of say, what are the implications of this? Okay, if this is a reasonable theory, um, if, if we take that as our starting point, we posit this theory, we postulate it, uh, what are its implications? Maybe we try two different theories, but we, we, we have something fairly concrete in a theory, um, maybe a, a reasonably plausible, to use Anna D.A. Ruse, uh, currently Dean of School of Public Health at Drexel, um, sort of uh, um, her word for it, you know, plausible representation, um, a plausible representation of dominant real world processes. And we, we often relate this uh, much to empirical data. Um, and, you know, many Operation Employed ABMs, published ABMs for policy and decision making um, live, live over here. But we're going to be talking about these caricature models, these models which are distinguished um, because of their simplicity. Uh, and their goal is sharpening thinking um, about the interaction of, of simple processes. We're not seeking to represent all sorts of texture. We're seeking, we're seeking to zero in on just a few things um, and, and really think them through and how they interact. Um, and typically we have little empirical data here. Often, but not always, we, we engage in this because we're engaging in theory building. And this, I, I like my col a colleague Ross Hammond's um, so the distinction between these theory building and theory explication, I think it rings rings true. So you'll recall the the notion of models as thinking tools from the very first day. I I articulated from you uh, for you this idea of models as thinking processes. To quote Jeff McDonald, the sage of Sydney, and you know these models can help us think through the consequences of of those theories we posit or of some other, other, you know, very simple interaction of, of certain processes. People have preferences um, for who they want to live with. And if those preferences are not met, they move. Um, and they move to a place that, that um, does match those preferences. Um, uh, simple idea. Um, uh, and we let it play out in shelling segregation model. Um, these models can help us, you know, stir up the learning process that, that helps us identify inconsistencies in our thinking. It says, gosh, if you have just that, look what results in ways we never would have anticipated. Look at those waves of infection that resulted in one of the first models we looked at, or, or, or look at that segregation pattern that can result or those blocks of trust you know different groups that trust each other but not uh, trust within the group but not trust the other group um um uh, we, tribes uh, emerge um so here we have these stylized models over on this side these caricature models to use carl simon's word for it that seek to stimulate high level insight um and they help us understand how simple mechanisms, just a few simple ideas, simple stylized facts, undeniable facts can yield unexpected behavior. Um, and they abstract away from the vagaries of particular situations to get at the heart of, of these potential issues. And you know, I, I've recommended to you shelling segregation before, and we're gonna be using that, but we're gonna see um, and I posted to the site some variants in this. We're going to see, um, you know, for example, continuous time variant of this. And we're going to look at, at um, how that can lead to patterns that um, have, you know, similar general feel, but maybe different in particular. So we're going to look at the game of life in more detail, but we'll also see variants of the game of life, um, which which yield profoundly different outcomes for slightly different assumptions. Um, 
And, you know, I, I will invite you to explore these uh, alongside me. Um, and we'll see a continuous time version of it that yields markedly different behavior, even with the same normal rules. Um, and we'll be talking about trust and, and how things like trust and respect, these quantities that are so profoundly important within our world, they almost are, are you know, building blocks of human relationships and, and key mediators for, um, for interactions in, in the care system, um, interacting of uh, interaction of individuals with, with health care and, and, and therefore evolution of, of health state. Um, these, these quantities, which are hard to, you know, have a really totally tied down theory of, but we can often get great insights by trying out some sort of very rough theories that involve these undeniable terms. So that, ladies and gentlemen, is the task to which we will press ourselves in our coming lecture. Um, so anyway, I'm looking forward to joining you for that. Um, and uh, I provided some slides which may get you thinking and a bunch of models. And we'll be, um, be looking at those um, on that day. We might also talk a little bit about trust dynamics and an oral health model, um, which is, is more applied and more textured, but which takes some of the insights from that earlier trust work. Um, one, one thing I've, I've realized I've fallen short, a, lot of, a fair number of these models have papers associated with them. And I, I'm gonna see if I can get better about posting links. Like the, the trust models are, are published. We have, I think, three trust models now. And um, uh, it's an area I want to do a lot more, uh, offer for a lot more investment, um, have prioritized for that investment. Anyway, that's all for today. Uh, thank you for bearing with my, uh, my, my weakened condition and my lack of physical appearance uh, in the classroom. But I'm looking forward to, to interacting with you here uh, uh, next time, and I think I will hold office hours uh, here. I'm I'm feeling not not altogether horrible. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, the question is: the O parties framework a standard reusable framework uh, for a method section in a publication? Um, it's interesting. Uh, the short answer is uh, no, um, but it in so when it comes to model specifications, um, um, I, I previously provided you slides on an on the ODD process, um, uh, which came out of uh, Volker, Grimm, and Railsbeck's uh, work. Um, overview, uh, design, and details, and then there's a variant of it, which I think Michael, you posted a link to a. Um, an extension of it, you posted a link to a um, paper, um, which which came out a few years later and extended it with an additional uh, uh, additional uh, bit of uh, um, sort of a module stuck onto it, which I really like. Um, so that's a, a well accepted one. It's used in uh, open ABMs, and it's it's been the basis for a lot of description models. Ross Hammond and I each have our own uh, kind of mechanism for thinking about model formulations. Ross has the Partey framework, um, uh, properties, actions, rules, time horizon and environment. Um, I, uh, I like that, um, but I feel that we really um, benefit for distinguishing instead of just properties, we distinguish things that are stat it's static assumptions uh, pr or pre-specified assumptions, which I call parameters and state. Um, and uh, I think it's really useful when thinking about the scope of a model to think about outcomes and interventions. Um, and uh, and uh, you know, there's uh, uh, there's therefore some. Um, elaboration of it that uh, I've put into place with the parties framework. But in, in many ways, I build on the Partey framework. 
I don't know. Partey may be published now. Um, Ross has certainly taught uh, taught it in a number of of events, uh, just as I've taught parties, and and he might have he might have published with it. But to the best of my knowledge, um, we don't have a a published description of it um, uh, yet, and we we really should. One of those things interrupted by the pandemic. Anyway. Uh, I would like to to contribute something like that. Hope that's useful. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think I'll stop recording.